immediately. When she arrives, she's alarmed to find emergency vehicles everywhere and her daughter Amelia is a suicide victim. When an anonymous text implies that all is not as it seems and that Amelia jumped, did not jump to her death, Kate's despair turns into disbelief and in turn a quest to piece together her daughter's last days. Kim is a graduate of Vassar College and the University of Pennsylvania Law School. After several years as a litigation associate at some of New York City's largest law firms, she left to write full time. Her work has appeared in publications such as Antietam Review, Oxford Magazine, and Babel. She lives in Park Slope with her husband and children. Please join me in welcoming Kim Great to New Canaan. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, as some of you may know, this has been a, um, a pretty long road in me getting here. Um, it involved about more than a decade of work uh, and several unpublished novels. Um, and I just want to take a minute before I get started with my presentation to thank some of the people that um, are here tonight who helped me um, keep with it, <laughs> um, as long as they did. Um, uh, I have some old friends in the audience, um, like Laura Mayer and her husband, Brian, in absentia. He's not here. But they were uh, some of the people who were just so um, patient with me and never asked, mm -hmm. why, why, why are you still doing this <laughs> all these years later? Um, I also want to thank um, Kathy Cragen and all the other Cragens who I know are here in spirit, uh, Steve, Melinda, and Kara. Um, Thank you for being such a warm extension of my own family. The, see, this is when I get upset, which happens every time I do this. Um, and I, start to say, I won't get upset in the rest, don't worry. Um, it's such a great extension of my own family over the years. And thank you so much for being supportive of the book and for rallying your troops, um, which I really appreciate. Um, and I want to thank uh, my dad, John McCrate, and his wife, Kim Healy, um, also for your support over the years. <laughs> Uh, and for rallying your significant troops um, and uh, helping make tonight such a success. Um, I want to thank my sister Cindy, I don't know where she went, there she is, um, for uh, also helping to bring people out tonight and to spread the word about the book. Um, I have joked that this book has been a bit like a human pyramid scheme where I've basically made every person I know tell 10 people they know. Um, but it's shocking it works, actually. Um, and uh, also, Cindy, just for being there for me always. And I really appreciate that. Um, I also want to thank my daughters, even though they're not here and they're torturing their babysitter back in Brooklyn. Um, because without them, I never would have had the inspiration to write the book. Um, and to my husband, Tony, who um, I'm going to thank at every one of these events, who is doubles as the AV man in a minute. Um, because I could thank him at every single one of these events, and it would never be thanks enough. Um, so what I'm going to show now is a little bit of a, a short video. It runs about seven minutes that shows some inspiration for um, the book. Yeah, can we dim the lights? You know, I think it's fine. Yeah, I'll see if I can do it.
We've done a lot of reporting over the years on bullying, but in the last couple of weeks, we've seen a number of new heartbreaking examples of just how dangerous it can be. Little kids who have killed themselves after being tormented. Just last night, if you're watching the program, I talked to the parents of this little boy, 13-year-old Asher Brown, who lived in Texas. He shot himself to death one week ago. His stepdad found his little body in the bottom, bottom of a closet. His parents say Asher was constantly bullied by four other kids because he was small and because he was gay. The story I want to talk about now is, though, is a kind of bullying unlike anything we've seen with little kids. Take a look at a picture of 18-year-old Tyler Clemente. He just started his freshman year at Rutgers University in New Jersey. He was a talented violinist. Today, a medical examiner confirmed that a body pulled out of the Hudson River yesterday is Tyler's. He committed suicide, apparently, by jumping off the George Washington Bridge. Now, on the day of his suicide, it looks like Clemente posted a note on his Facebook page. It said simply, jumping off the GW Bridge. Sorry. This is 15-year-old Amanda Todd's desperate cry for help. So what would you think of me now? In this video, the high school student details three years of torment, bullying, and even she says classmates beating her up. Three weeks after posting the video on YouTube, Amanda Todd committed suicide. Hi, this is Jamie from Buffalo, New York, and I'm just here to tell you that it does get better. 14-year-old Jamie Rotemeyer had been bullied relentlessly since fifth grade. But Sunday, Jamie's parents, Tim and Tracy, found his body outside their home. All the girls just loved him, and they always defended him. But all the boys would say, geez, you're such a girl. Why are you hanging out with all those girls? What are you, a girl? Oh, you must be gay. He was harassed by online insults. Because that's all you have to do, just love yourself and you're set. But just weeks ago, that optimism seemed gone. He posted this online plea for help. I always say how bullied I am, but no one listens. What do I have to do so people will listen to me? I wish that I could just tell her that sometimes I just want her to love me in a way that I don't get from anyone else. And I was raised in the country. Something I want to tell her. I don't know. I feel like I tell her too much already. <laughs> if you were her. I'll try to tell you less, okay? Um. No, not really. You can always tell me anything. Yeah, there's this really obnoxious girl in my grade. You were right. She wasn't a good friend. I deserve her. I picked on this girl at school. I wish I could tell you what they made me do. I don't even know why. I've had sex more than once. It was gross. It was really, really gross. I'm okay with it. You can't control everything. I hate how you talk to me. I'm sorry, too. No, I tell everything to my daughter. I don't know what else I wish that you would have an open relationship with me. <laughs> you can trust me with all of you. I wish I could tell you all the things I did, but I never, never will. I wish I were more like you. I'm sorry I don't tell I don't tell you I love you more. You don't have to be scared. I want so much more for you. You'll do fine and 
there's nothing really to be worried about because you're smart. What secrets are you going to keep from me? <gasps> ah! Nice. Thought she will love me no matter what because it's one thing, it's one thing knowing that, but but it's another thing having someone having someone tell you that. I was just going to read a, um, a little piece from the novel, <clears throat> starting at the uh, beginning of the book. Um, Kate, the mother in the story, uh, she's a single mother of a teenage daughter who's really a model um, student in every way. Um, and they have a great relationship. And she gets a call at work. Uh, she's a lawyer. She gets a call at work summoning her to her daughter's um, private school, saying that she's been suspended. Uh, so she's had to leave a really important um, meeting to, to get there. Um, by the time the train was pulling out into Grand Army Plaza, Kate was one hour and 15 minutes late. She sprang off when the train doors finally hissed open, her heart picking up speed as she jogged for the station steps. Up on the sidewalk, she blinked back the brightness, shielding her eyes with a hand. She walked briskly, turning onto Prospect Park West. The two-lane, one-way street was quiet at that hour, and Kate's very high, client-meeting heels clicked loudly against the concrete. The park, with its brightly-hued late-October maples, was across the street on her left. The leaves had begun to fall, gathering in a thick ridge along the wall lining the park, a park Kate hadn't been inside in years. After 15 years in Park Slope, Kate felt, still felt more at home in her office than on her own Brooklyn block. She had wanted a cozy, neighborly, open-minded place to raise Amelia, and Park Slope was certainly all of those things. But the food co-op walkers, the piles of recycled goods left out for the taking, and the tight cliques of shabby chic families gathered on playgrounds adjacent to their multi-million dollar brownstones still felt like charming details from someone else's life. Up ahead, Kate watched two quintessential Park Slope moms, attractive and urban without being overtly hip, chatting as they came out of the park. Each pushed a sleek jogging stroller, a small child gripped in their one free hand, an eco-friendly water bottle in their cup holders. They were laughing as they walked on, unbothered by their little ones tugging at their hands. Watching them, Kate felt as if she'd never had a child of her own. Kate had always planned on having a family, at least two children, maybe even three. She'd originally hoped to avoid having an only child, given her own less than happy, solitary girlhood. She had come to realize, though, that having an only did not actually require that she treat them from birth like a mini adult. Kate had also assumed that however many children she did have one day, they would come later, much, much later. Kate was going to focus on her career first, make some headway as her mother Gretchen, professor of neurology at the University of Chicago School of Medicine, had drilled into her. Career first, kids only if there was time. But her life had taken a different turn, and in the end, she hadn't wanted to take advantage of any of the options Gretchen had pressed on her to handle her unfortunate situation because Kate may have admired her mother's professional success, but she had no wish to emulate her in any other way. Instead, Kate took her pregnancy as a sign, one that she would ignore at her peril, and also as a chance for something more. Motherhood, of course, had been hard, especially single motherhood at the age of 24 while still attending law school, but she, they, had survived. Kate and Amelia's true salvation had been Leela, the nanny who'd cared for Amelia for 15 straight years. It was Leela's warmth and compassion and excellent cooking that had truly kept their heads above water. It was with great regret that Kate had scaled back Leela's hours to only cooking and cleaning while Amelia was at school. Amelia had been insisting since last fall that she was too old for a nanny, and Kate had finally lacked the fortitude to fight her anymore. They both missed Leela, though, Amelia more than she would admit, Kate more than she could sometimes bear. Kate paused as the two women with their strollers crossed the street in front of her, then followed them as they headed across Garfield. She watched their narrow hips and their yoga pants, their high matching ponytails swishing left, right, and then left. 
Look at all those fire trucks, gasped the one woman, stopping so abruptly on the opposite corner that Kate almost crashed into her perfectly sculpted rear end. Are they at the school? Oh, God, I hope not, the other one said, pushing up on her toes to get a better look. They're not rushing anywhere, at least. It must be a false alarm. Kate looked toward the fire trucks blocking half of Garfield Street. They were parked in front of a side entrance to Grace Hall's upper school, an ornate old mansion that looked like a grand public library. Several police cars were in front of the adjacent Grace Hall lower school, two brownstones that had been overtaken long ago and refurbished in a similar style. The firemen were loitering around the sidewalk, chatting in groups, leaning against their trucks. There was also an ambulance sitting there with its lights off, doors closed. If there had been an actual fire or some other emergency, it was over now, or maybe it had been a false alarm. Amelia couldn't have pulled the fire alarm, could she have? No, only juvenile delinquents did things like pull fire alarms. Whatever Amelia's mood lately, whatever that junior year abroad nonsense had been about, and however deep her sudden existential crisis about her absent dad, Amelia was not and would never be a juvenile delinquent. Kate took a deep breath and exhaled loudly, which caused the taller mother standing in front of her to startle and spin around. She tugged her cherub-faced little girl in the pinky, puffy pink vest closer. Kate smiled awkwardly as she stepped around them. She tried to see past the ambulance. There, on the side, was a uniformed officer talking to an older gray-haired woman in a long brown sweater. She was walking a tiny, shivering dog and was hugging herself hard. People weren't interviewed for fire alarms. Kate looked up at the classroom windows. And where were all the kids, the ones whose faces should have been pressed up against the glass investigating the commotion? Kate found herself moving closer. So you heard the scream first, the police officer asked the gray-haired woman, or the sound? Scream. Sound. Kate watched two police officers come out from the school's front door, head down the steps, then turn into the school's side yard. When she peered after them, she could finally see that that was where the real action was. At least a dozen officers were gathered in a large pack, and still, there was no rushing. It no longer seemed like a good sign. In fact, it was beginning to seem like a terrible one. Ma'am, came a loud voice then right in Kate's ear. I'm going to need you to head back over there to the other side of the street. We need to keep this area clear. There was a hand on her arm, too, hard and unfriendly. Kate turned to see a huge police officer towering over her. He had a doughy, doughy boyish face. I'm sorry, ma'am, he said again, a tiny bit less forcefully, but this side of the street is closed to pedestrians. But my daughter's inside the school. Kate turned back to look up at the building. A bomb threat, an anthrax scare, a school shooting. Where were all the children? Kate's heart was picking up speed. I need to get my daughter. I'm supposed to. They called me. I'm already late. The officer squinted at her for a long time as though he was willing her to disappear. Okay, I guess. I can go check it out, he said, looking skeptical. But you still got to go wait over there. He pointed to the other side of Garfield. What's your daughter's name? Amelia. Amelia Barron. They called from the headmaster's office to say she'd been suspended, that I had to come get her. Immediately, Kate wished she had left that part out. The officer might be less inclined to help if he thought Amelia was a troublemaker, maybe even the troublemaker. Wait, before you go, Kate called after him. Can you at least tell me what happened? We're still trying to figure that out. His voice drifted as he turned to stare up at the building for a minute. Then he turned back to Kate and pointed again. Now go, there, I'll be right back. Kate didn't go where he'd pointed. Instead, she stood on her toes to see if she could make out what was in the backyard. She could see there were actually more than a dozen officers back there, some in uniform, some in dark suits, clustered up near the side of the building and their, their backs forming a, forming a curved wall. It was as if they were hiding something, something awful. Someone had been hurt or worse. Kate felt sure of it now. Had there been a fight, a stray bullet? This was Brownstone, Brooklyn, but it was still Brooklyn. Things happened. As soon as the police officer who'd stopped Kate was through the school's front door, she darted up to the fence at the side yard. Officers were shielding their eyes as they stared up the side of the building toward the roof. Kate stared up there, too. She could see nothing except the immaculately maintained facade of an old stole, the old stone building. When she looked back down, the officers had shifted. And there, in the center of their protective circle, was a boot. Black, flat-heeled, rugged. It lay there on its side like a felled animal. But there was something else there, too. Something else much larger. Something covered with a sheet. Kate's heart was pounding as she wrapped her fingers around the bars of the wrought iron fence and squeezed. She looked at the boot again. It was the kind that lots of girls wore with skinny jeans or leggings. But Amelia's were brown, weren't they? Kate should know. She should know the color of her own daughter's shoes. Mrs. Barron came a man's voice then. Kate whipped around, bracing to be told by the same baby-faced policeman that she wasn't where he told her to be. Instead, behind her was an attractive but tough-looking guy in jeans and a hooded sweatshirt. 
He was about Kate's age with a strong square face, a tightly shaped head, and the bound up energy of a boxer, or maybe a criminal about to make a break for it. There was a badge hanging from a cord around his neck. You're Kate Barron, he asked, taking a step closer. He had a tough Brooklyn twang that went with the rest of him, but he was trying to seem soft. Kate didn't like his trying to be gentle with her. It made her nervous. Behind him, Kate could see the uniformed officer she talked to before, standing on the steps with a gray-haired woman in red reading glasses. They were staring at her. Where's Amelia? Kate heard herself shout. Or had it been someone else? It sounded like her voice, but she hadn't felt the words coming out of her mouth. What's happened? I'm Detective Molina, he reached out a hand, but stopped short of actually putting it on Kate's arm. A tattoo on his forearm, a cross, his forearm, a cross, peeked out from beneath the sleeve of his sweatshirt. Could you please come with me, ma'am? This wasn't right. She didn't want to go somewhere with this detective. She wanted to be sent somewhere out of the way where all the other irrelevant spectators were sent. No, Kate jerked away, her heart racing. Why? It's okay, ma ma'am, he said, putting a strong hand on her elbow and tugging her toward, toward him. Now his voice was lower, more careful, as if Kate had a horrific head wound she was unaware of. Why don't you just come over here with me and have a seat? Kate closed her eyes and tried to picture Amelia's feet that morning when she happily bounded out the door. Mothers were supposed to know the kind of shoes their children were wearing. They were supposed to check. Kate felt lightheaded. I don't want to have a seat, she said, her panic rising. Just tell me what's wrong. Tell me now. Okay, Mrs. Barron, okay, Detective Molina said quietly. There's been an accident. But Amelia's okay, right? Kate demanded, leaning back against the fence. Why weren't they rushing? Why was the ambulance just sitting there? Where were all the flashing lights? She has to be okay. I need to see her. I need her. Where is she? Kate should run. She felt sure of it. She needed to go somewhere far away where no one could tell her anything. But instead, she was sinking, sliding down to the cold, hard sidewalk. There she sat, balled up against her knees, mouth pressed hard against them as if she were bracing herself for a crash landing. Run, she told herself, run. But it was too late. And for one long, last moment, there was only the sound of her heart beating, the pressure of her tight, shallow pants. Your daughter, Amelia, the detective was crouched next to her now. She fell from the roof, Mrs. Barron. She was. She unfortunately didn't survive the fall. I'm sorry, Mrs. Barron, but your daughter Amelia is dead. So I think I can take questions now. I didn't know if I was running. I guess I'm running the Q&A. But if people have questions, um, I'm happy to take them. Anybody? You can all get a drink now if you want and just take a minute. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. How long ago did you decide to do that? Because she's so immediate, you know, she's so plainly and probably strong enough to get this kind of response. This particular idea? Uh, probably just a couple years. I mean, I think I, the idea, I started writing it right after the idea came to me, which was like in 2010. So. And it took me about two years to write. Uh, you know, I will say that some of the details, you know, get filled in and shift over time. So, like, you know, where, like the initial idea comes, you know, some of the details about the texts that are included, et cetera, like some of that has evolved, evolved in the writing. Um, but, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, a lot of the, the stories have been going on for a number of years now. I mean, it's hard to believe, but really, you know, the Tyler Clemente incident was in 2010. Um, and so they really have been just, you kind of are constantly hearing about them, but they've actually been happening for, uh, just very publicly. Obviously, they've been happening for a very, very long time, but um, yeah, for a number of years. Okay. Um, I think it helps in the, um, the way you have to be critical when you're editing. And I think there's kind of two um, parts of writing. One is just this free form, at least the way I write. Everyone writes differently, I suppose. But I don't outline in any detail. I kind of know the beginning and the end. And then when I get far enough along, then I fill in the details um, of an outline. But I really just kind of write from this kind of unconscious place, the first draft. Um, but the, the more analytic part of me really helps when you kind of totally have to take off this other hat. There's all these like hats with <laughs> writing. There's the, the first draft, I feel like there's an editing, and then there's this, which is a totally different thing. Um, but so for the editing part, I think being a lawyer helps. 
because you really, you know, I tried to challenge myself about the, you know, credibility of things and whether or not things made sense. And um, so I think it helped on that level. Somebody had a hand up over there. Mm. It's actually third person, um, but it's close third person. So it feels like um, it feels like first person. Um, so so Kate's is third person, and Amelia's is first person. Um, interestingly, when I set out to write this book, um, I've always written with multiple narrators, um, but that doesn't always make that an easy book to sell. Um, so I actually sat down to write this book, and I was like, I'm sure Tony remembers this. I was like, I'm just, I'm getting one person, and I'm taking one person from the beginning to the end, and that's it. Um, and this one I'm going to sell. Um, and I sat down with Kate, and I was going to write it all from Kate's perspective. Um, but then I was like, who doesn't want to go to Amelia's school and, like, be with Amelia? Like, I just was like, yeah, I want to go be with Amelia, you know? Um, so... I felt like as a reader and as a writer, um, I added her voice second. She's in um, the first person. And part of the reason why I did that was um, because she's not alive. I mean, in the sections you're reading it, are, they're in the past. So she is alive in those moments. But I felt like it helped with the immediacy of her sections for you to be brought closer to her. Because um, you had to kind of, you have to kind of get over the fact that she's, you know, as a reader, she's not alive. Um, but I think it's, you forget as you're reading the book, that that's the case. Um, and I think that that being, you know, in first person helps that. Yeah. So when I was in high school, my high school writing teacher said, write what you know. Mm. So I'm curious how much you, how much, how were you connected personally and how did you put yourself into a place where there's personal No, although, well, first of all, I mean, obviously, the details about Kate being a lawyer, I mean, Kate's a lawyer in part because that's a world I know. And so I know what it's like to work those hours. I know, what, you know, what kind of meeting she would have been in, who would have been there, you know, what it would mean to interrupt it. I know the partner structure. So that's an easy career. I mean, that's for me to, to do. Um, so I did that. The, um, I think the parenting in Park Slope, although it doesn't actually play a huge role in the book, um, Park Slope is a notorious kind of neighborhood for parenting, and I don't think actually that many tropes, I don't draw on that as much, but certainly living in Park Slope was a big part of it. Um, I feel like uh, Amelia is a lot informed by what I felt as at uh, her age. I didn't, um, I wouldn't say I was, it's funny now, I would say I had never been a victim of bullying, but as I was, you know, doing interviews and et cetera, I mean, I can remember being jacked up against a locker wall by something. It's funny, like, I'm like, I wasn't bullied. I'm like, well, there was that whole jacking up against the locker <laughs> thing. I guess that, um, but I don't, I wasn't a victim of terrible um, bullying. Um, I do, uh, I think I come at this book most as a mother. And it, for me, it's a bit of a ghost story for my own kids are only six and nine. And I think that um, it's a lot me, you know, being afraid for them. And I can already see with my older daughter, things starting to play out and the complexities about dealing with these issues when your kid comes to you and tells you something and getting them to be honest and whatever. And, and I think I spent a lot of time writing being like, oh my God, like, what am I going to do? And <laughs> this is what it's going to be like. So I think that's where it came from. I just, I just ignore them. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm kidding. I do. They probably would say yes. She does. Um, no, I. You know, I, uh, we made a commitment a long time ago to treat my writing, even in the very long, lean years um, where I wasn't hadn't sold a book, um, to treat it like it was any other job. And I think that's really critical, whether or not you're trying to write on your own now and get somewhere. I think you have to really treat it. Uh, like it is a job. And in fact, you know, the reality is a lot of the world won't treat it that way. Um, and so I think it's important to, we've had, you know, babysitters and childcare for me for, I guess, ever since the kids were babies. I mean, obviously, when they were really little babies, we didn't have as much money for childcare. So I did write a lot when they napped. I mean, the earlier books were when they napped. I can remember them being in the car seat next to me. I can remember, you know, there have been stretches where I would get up at 4 a.m. and work 
if I had a deadline and I needed more hours and when we had more limited childcare, um, I would work four to six, then deal with the kids six to eight, then write eight to three, you know. Um, I did do a lot of that. Uh, now it's easier. They're in school and I have them in after school. So now I get to work eight hour days, um, you know, and so, but I do think it's critical um, to make it a real job because it, uh, it, it is, you know. Um, Sorry, 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 go ahead. Yes, you go. Um, well, it was a very, it was, it was a very long process. Um, I, I actually never had trouble right, getting agents. Um, I, uh, the, for the first book I wrote was in uh, the year 2000. Um, I moved, took a leave of absence from my job as a lawyer and, and wrote one in, um, we lived in London for a year. And I thought, if I can write this book and sell it in the end of the year, by the end of the year, I will not go back and be a lawyer. Um, and so I did write the book and I had never written a book. I'd never published anything, I'd never done anything. But I knew that I thought I wanted to be a, lawyer, uh, a writer. And so I wrote the book in the year and that agent, a friend helped me get. She's an under, a friend from law school, was an entertainment lawyer. And, I, and she passed my manuscript to him. But I did just write cold letters. I wrote a lot of cold letters, um, meaning I had no introduction. I just you know, wrote them. And he represented that first book. Um, but that book didn't sell. Uh, I came close to selling, did not sell. So there was a second agent. <laughs> um, that one I just got through mailing letters. I mean, there's a process, like all these things. You, know, you mail a letter describing your book. And if they like that, they say, okay, send me a chapter, and then that takes like a year for them to ask that, and then it takes them like a year to read your chapter, and then they ask for, okay, send me half the book, and then if they like that, they said, it takes forever. Um, the only good news about that is if you're, you start another book, which is how you end up writing five books without selling them, because you're like getting an agent for that one, and then you're waiting, there's all this waiting involved in the process. Um, the agent who sold this book is actually my third agent, um, who I also got, the funny story about her was I, she took me on with my last book, which did not sell, but I only had half of the book written. And um, I had lost my previous agent. She decided that wasn't a book she could sell, so she said, let's part ways. And so I started querying, you call it querying people, and I um, sent, I, this woman, this, my agent now is a woman named Marley Rusoff, and her, um, her website said very clearly, do not send me unfinished material. Do not send me things that's not been critiqued. It's a very, do not, you know, all these things do not. And she's a very, very good agent. And I was like, oh, whatever. I'm just going to send it. And she's not going to call me anyway. You know, like, what is, like, whatever. It was among the many things I did. And I think I had, I had like five or six chapters of the book at that point. And uh, <laughs> the, three days later, she called, which never happens. And she said, I, I'm a, you know, she wanted to say how much she loved the book. And she goes, you, had, you have to send me the rest. Of, she's old school, so she calls. She doesn't use email. And she said, uh, you have to send me the rest of it today. And I was like, oh, my God, this is the woman who said don't send her something. So I had to say, I was like, there's not a, there's, there isn't anymore. That's all there, there is. And now you're going to yell at me, and we're never going to talk again. Um, but she didn't. And she said, OK, we'll hurry up and finish it, you know. Um, and so I did, and she, you know, again, that book didn't sell, but she stuck with me, and this one did, so. Yes? What was the research process? Um, you know, I, I, it was researching, you know, team behavior online, you know, there's the, looking at the news accounts of these various events. I would say the school in here, as well as the events, are kind of an amalgam of many different things, you know. Uh, there was a New York Magazine article about, you know, things kids are doing with their phones, sending suggestive photos, et cetera. That was a piece of it. I mean, I kind of, you know, pieced together a bunch of stories and then gave them my own spin. So, um, but it, there was a piece uh, about talking to local teenagers. Um, I grew up, uh, I went to a boarding, private school, but I went to a boarding school. And I also didn't grow up, uh, I grew up in the suburbs here and then in Pennsylvania. And um, so I didn't know what uh, teenagers did in, in, Brook, in Brooklyn. It's different because you don't, because they don't have to drive. They are out on their own a lot more, um, which my nine-year-old is already reminding me of. Um, so, I, I, you know, I talked to her a lot, you know, people about that. Where do you go? What do you do? Um, and also did some, you know, sanity checking about how do you talk? Because actually it's different. Every school, some are 
GChat, some are Facebook messaging, some are, you know, it depends. Um, so I, I got some of the lingo, et cetera, that way. Okay, yes. What's the uh, uh, percentages between the boys uh, bullying other boys, girls bullying other girls, or the girls uh, text more often than boys? Mm -hmm. What's that percentage? Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I think, um, I think that girls, I, I'm not an expert on bullying, I'm just going to throw that out there, but from my research, I, my understanding is that girls do um, cyberbullying more, um, they text more, and they're on their phones more, um, and that the percentage of bullying, kind of in-school bullying, is slightly higher um, for boys. It's not a dramatic difference um, in either case, um, but I think that the text, the online stuff is more common among girls. You mean crossing genders? Yeah. Um, and this comes from the Sticks and Stones book that I just read uh, about bullying, um, and Emily Brazelin's book. But um, my understanding is that boys bully boys and girls, and that girls mostly only bully girls. So that it doesn't, which I guess maybe makes some just logical sense. Um, that, that, but again, I don't know the percentages. I just think that that's slightly more it would be more uncommon for a girl to bully a boy. Yes? Mm. It's funny, Kate's name was actually um, Emily originally. Um, and I liked that their names were so similar. It was Emily and Amelia, and that was intentional, you know, that there was such great similarity. And there's a lot of parallels between their, the arcs of their stories. Um, but interestingly, in foreign countries, um, Emily and Amelia are uh, the same name. <laughs> and so some foreign publishers were like, yeah, we can't have the two characters have the same name. So I did, I switched it. Um, but I often, um, you know, try on a name and, you know, it just has to feel right. Um, but there is a piece of it where I gravitate unconsciously towards certain letters in the alphabet. And so I have to be careful. I'm like, oh, they all have C names. You know, I got to move some of them around. Or I'll give somebody a name accidentally of somebody I know. Um, so, yeah, I have to kind of watch for that and try to switch it around afterwards. But there's definitely names that feel right and that don't feel right for them, for sure. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you mean the you mean the pro the getting it published? You mean in that way, or do you just mean the pro turning into a writer from being a lawyer? Turning into a writer as well as studying this. Oh, this problem. Um, it's made me more aware. I haven't come to any answers. I would say um, it's made me, I think, more keenly aware that I lack the answers and that there's a clock ticking. <laughs> Am I going to check her uh, phone every, t what's going to be my policy? Am I going to have all her passwords? Am I going to, how often am I going to check it? Where's trust? When am I going to say, it? you know, like I, there are clearly answers in about, you know, <laughs> another year I'm going to have to have better answers for. Um, but it's interesting how they work, I would say, in conjunction, like, you know, in writing this book, um, my daughter at one point was, uh, was what I thought actually for the first time kind of was bullied in school in a way that, you know, was her physical appearance was picked on in a way that felt more permanent. Um, you know, kids do all sorts of things, but it was the first time I was like, wow, that's actually the kind of thing you'll remember if you're her. Um, and I remember she's telling me this and I, um, I thought, well, I'm going to, I'm going to call the parent. I'm going to call the parents. I'm going out to see, and it was like all like a double, you know, shotguns ready to, you know, go and be mother lion. And, um, it, she, her reaction to that, she said, um, she said, if you, if you do that, if you call them, if you say anything, she said, I will never tell you anything ever again. And I was like, Oh, crap, you know, like that's just, that was going to be easy because that, I'm good at that. Like I'm good at going, I'm just going to confront you and I'm going to call. It's so much more complicated and you out there with older children, I, I'm, I already know that, I'm sure, but it is, you know, it's like you want them to be honest with you and you want to be there for them and, and um, you know, it, a lot of the book is about that. I mean, I do think that one, it re this book is a reminder to me to be honest with them about the person that I am. I mean, there's a piece in the book that's about the secrets that Kate keeps and about 
I think Emily's uh, Amelia's perception of her as being perfect, her mother being perfect. And um, I do think there's a thing about kids thinking their parents are, would never have done the stupid thing that they just did or would never, um, that I think leads to them not sharing. So I think that I'm more conscious of that now, you know, being honest with them. Yes. No, it definitely takes on a life of its own. I think one of the most interesting things about writing is um, the kind of trail of breadcrumbs you leave for yourself, um, that you make something happen that seems inconsequential early on, and um, you get to the end of the book and you need some thread to link something back, and you're like, oh, that's why I did that. You know, like, and you can look back. And so there, there is a piece of it that um, it writes, part of it writes itself. And that to me is the kind of magic of the whole process because you can't make that happen. And that's why you have to kind of just be unfettered. Um, but there are, there's again that editorial part where you do have to, you know, there were, I mean, this is, you know, it's not like this was the first draft, you know? I mean, there, um, the story had a different, not a fundamentally different shape, but a, you know, the very first version of this book had a different story arc in one of the spots. And um, so, you know, it's, it is, an, I feel like it's a bit like shaping something, you know, um, over time. Anybody? Yeah. Your mother two books, um, that they didn't sell. Yeah. Are you going to work on them anymore and try again? And how does it compare to the first book? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't think it's a period of time. I think they weren't. They weren't good. No, I'm, they, 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 it's not that they weren't good, but they, my writing has certainly evolved over time. And I think that um, uh, it wasn't, they weren't complete. Like the very first book I wrote, I think had a germ of like this amazing idea, but it was missing half a book <laughs> that I realize now. And I, I kind of termed that like it was very literary, meaning, but it wasn't literary, it just wasn't finished. You know, like there's a difference. Um, there's great literary works that aren't story driven. My books are story driven, and thus they need to have the whole story there. Um, so uh, I think I could go back and make those books. I could revise them and make them really strong, great books. But at the same time, you know, what tends to capture my imagination is stuff in the news. And so, you know, I'm like, well, that would make. I'm much, you know, it's like I'm interested in finding out what happens as I write the story. So I'm like, do I really want to, you know, revising is a different process. So it's kind of nice to go into something totally new and, you know, create it, so, yes. Um, since you're writing, since you've written a novel about kids, what do your girls think or talk to you about when they read it? Um, well, they don't, my nine-year-old really wants to read it. Um, yeah, no, she definitely wants to read it. And in fact, she did pick up, we have boxes, you can imagine boxes of the book, and she picked up the book and read what is the blog entry, which is the first entry, and was like, I cannot believe you wrote down all those bad words, was what she said to me. <laughs> it's like, great, great. Um, so anyway, but uh, they know what it's about. I mean, the basic outline, you know, this, the, the, the girl might have, you know, so it was the first time I had to say suicide. I said that she might have killed herself, and that was, I waited for kind of like, and they were like, oh, <laughs> I mean, you know, just in that typical kid way, like, oh, I guess that's the thing that happens. Um, so they don't know, and I, they do know that bullying is a theme of the book, but they don't know anything more. Um, I think they're, uh, you know, right now they're over it. As my six-year-old said the other day, she, my phone went on and I had something on there where the screen of my book came up immediately, and she said, that is just everywhere. Like, make <laughs> it stop. So, you know, like any woman parent's job, I think they're over it. Although, you know, my nine-year-old, I think, would love to be a writer, and it's very cute, and she's very always wanting to, she wants to do a middle school series with me to write a series, and she's always starting various stories, and, and I, I think that's very cute and exciting that she sees that as a legitimate thing to do, you know, like, oh, she's like, yeah, so I'm just going to publish a book. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that's nice, so. Sorry, did you have a question? You. Yeah. Um, the actual, again, the first draft for me is once I have the general idea, 
sometimes the beginning is very rough because you're just figuring out where you're going. Um, but I don't, um, knock on wood, I'm going to say I don't generally struggle from writer's block, and I'm probably going to go home now and never be able to write again. But <laughs> anyway, um, so, but in general, that's not a problem. I can write, I have like a page limit I try to hit, a word count I try to hit every day. And a lot of times the, that word count, it's, um, it's, it's 4,000 terrible words. Um, but you just accept that's part of the process. You're like, well, that day, that whole thing's going in the garbage at some point. Um, so I didn't hit walls like that. I would say the revision process for this book was tough. I mean, it, it you know, wasn't clear at first whether or not I needed, it, it sits on kind of a bridge between genres. Um, it is an adult book, but there's a, a young adult voice, um, and that can be a tough sell. Uh, so there was some question about whether or not I should make it into just a young adult book. I should take all the, some people really, really, really love The Voice of Amelia um, and thought it should just be a young adult book. But I felt really strongly for me that the book was about motherhood and that Kate's voice was critical to making that, um, making that point. So there were moments of despair. They mostly came in the revision part um, and waiting to see if it would go. Yes. Yeah, I mean, part of part of it's obviously sales. Um, you know, I do think that certain topics are viewed as more marketable than others. Um, it is the process of getting a book made into a movie is tough, even for movies, books that were hands down, you know, incredible bestsellers. You'd be shocked to find out, and then that got made into successful movies. Like you would be shocked to find out. Um, that it took a lot of convincing for those movies to get made. You think, well, that's a no-brainer. Of course they would make that into a movie. Um, but it's, you know, there have been wildly popular books like The Lovely Bones that don't necessarily translate into profitable movies. I didn't see the movie myself. I read the book. But I, I, I don't think that the sales ne they didn't necessarily meet the book, book's expectations. Um, so I think people are wary. I think that film studios are wary, certainly, of dark stories. I'll say that from experience. Um, you know, the Hollywood likes a, either an action movie or a happy ending. So, um, yeah, so it, 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 it's a lot driven by profitability like anything else, um, unless you go to, you know, an independent direction. It does have a timely subject. I can, I'm not going to disclose the actual I'm too superstitious, but um, it is a similar um, vein. It's like an, a, it's a mystery. It's kind of dark, it, but it has a deep emotional. It's current. It's like, you know, has to do with kind of topical issues again. Um, and one of the characters from this book is, plays a supporting role in that book, which links them, I think, kind of nicely. Um, and, yeah, so I'm, I'm at work on it, though. Um, librarians have set it at an uh, older teen, which I think the key is like 15 to 18, um, but 100%. I mean, like those, you know, the school library journal, which is the librarians for um, schools, obviously. That's why it's called the school library journal. Um, you know, they've re they're recommending it for teens, so I think um, for sure. I mean, my real dream is honestly that, that parents and kids would read it together and that they would, you know, talk about it. And if the issues in it don't have to be the issues in your family, but I think you can see reading it how it plays out, how you don't things go unsaid, and sometimes at critical moments. Uh, so, for sure, work. Yes. I haven't. It's a good idea. Um, I mean, there's reading group questions, but that's not exactly the same thing. So that's a very good idea. I will. I'm going to send an email. That's a good idea. <laughs> that's marketing help from the audience. Um, any other questions? Yeah, I was I was mentioning to her that they're uh, in 
I don't think they were necessarily in my associate class at, um, at Paul Weiss, but they were, which Paul Weiss is where I worked as a lawyer. Um, they were around my same tenure, but three of us have novels coming out this year. <laughs> All kind of touching on one, actually, I think is called Partner Track, um, which I think is something I have to do with a large law firm. I don't know about the, the third, but yeah, it's pretty um, amazing. That's why you know, like many, many frustrated writers or lawyers or frustrated lawyers or writers. Or,